got to prove herself to her big brother, and um, it's it's a, just a marvelous, um, ultimately heartwarming, and and very moving um, first novel. I'm waiting for the next one. I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Good. So keep going. So just a little bit of background about June. She uh, has um, received her MFA in writing and literature from uh, Bennington College. She's had many interesting jobs, just a few I'll mention. Uh, a teacher, community activist, and graphic designer, um, among many other talents. And we're especially delighted to welcome Susan Scarf Merrill to, to Canios again. The two will be in conversation about the book, and they have both a connection uh, through Bennington College and through writing. Um, and Susie wrote the most beautiful <coughs> review of this book, and is is a fan as I am of it. Um, as some of you will know, Susie Scarf Merrill is the author of wonderful novel Shirley. Uh, we have copies of that. Um, <laughs> Another novel, Member of the Family. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes, great. And we have it in paperback. <laughs> Excellent. This is great. And a, a work of nonfiction, The Accidental Bond, about sibling relationships. Susie teaches in the MFA program, uh, the Creative Writing and Literature program at Stony Brook, Southampton. And we're in for a treat. You've um, You've been gracious enough to work with another writer in the room, Amy Turner, who's here. I know we're going to have a lovely discussion and we'll have time for questions afterwards. So please give a warm welcome now to June and Susie. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be at this bookstore. I've been to events at this bookstore, and it just has this kind of storied place in my mind. And this is actually the first bookstore reading I've done on Long Island. Oh, so I did 15 or 20 events last year, and I went all over New England, and I went to Mississippi, and all kinds. Of, and I didn't do any readings here. Okay. <laughs> so this is very special. Welcome. To me. And, Welcome. Um, and also to be doing this with Susie Merrill is like this is my signed copy of Shirley that I've had on my... Well, t t show them what... Because so, this is yeah. from 100 years ago. It's, <laughs> well, 2014 is when... <laughs> <laughs> and I went to her reading, because um, I was just fabulously excited about her book launch, and the book is so good, you should read Shirley. Mm -hmm. um, and funny she wrote... Um, next next book will be yours. XOXOX, mm. um, oh. Susan. And... Oh. Um, it, it was only, oh, I don't know, eight more years before the book came out. <laughs> but, but it was in progress then. But it's the only book that's been published since <laughs> <laughs> so, so, So I, I really want to start because I think one of the things, first of all, I would like to know how many people in this room have a tattoo. Let's see, that's really interesting. Three. <laughs> How many people have children with tattoos? Mm. That's different. <laughs> 11,000. <000. laughs> um, but so this idea of writing about a young woman in the 80s who uh, wants to become a tattoo artist, what's the genesis of this novel? So um, my first visit to a tattoo shop, I was six years old. Um, I was not getting tattooed, but my mom was. Um, you should not bring a six-year-old to a tattoo shop, but my mom, my mom, I think most tattoo artists would be like, get get her out of here, but I don't know. My mom was just a very unconventional person. She had a black belt in karate. She was just, would do, my mom just would do what she wanted to do. She was an artist. She was, she's amazing. Um, so she was, she had had a tattoo that she didn't like anymore. And she went and she got it covered up with a butterfly and took me with her. And like, my memory of this day is very dim. I was only six. Um, but I loved that tattoo. I would sit on, you know, after it healed, I would just sit on my mom's lap and like trace the lines of this butterfly. And she was an artist. I was an artist from when I was little. And the thought that you could have art on your body was just, I, I don't know, beautiful and fascinating to me. Um, the things that people chose that you're, I'm committing to this art forever, that was interesting. So I would just pour over tattoo magazines. Um, and when it came time to write my first novel, I was 19, I'm like, whoa, I'm getting older. I'm getting serious now. <laughs> yeah, like, right, I know, I'm like, what is this? I can yeah. start my first novel. So um, I thought, what's a place I would like to spend time in fictionally? And I just wanted to be in a tattoo shop. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was how it began. That's cool. 
That's really great. That's really great. And it, in, a, in a way, you can feel all through this book that you know and love every place and person in it. I mean, I think one of the things that's so striking about this novel, I think it's, I think it's rare to feel this kind of love for characters. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wonder um, how much of the actual story just evolved over the course of, because you wrote it for many, many years. Yeah. So <laughs> did, you know, did you know this story the whole time? Mm -mm. No, it did evolve over many years. Um, so I'm obviously much older than 19 now. <laughs> 21. Yeah, um, I, I worked on this book for literally 20 years, and I wrote about 20 drafts of it. And in the beginning, it was a mother-daughter story, and um, it took place in, you know, Circle Y2K. And the mother was Gina, and she had a teenage daughter. And oh. I know, so Gina is the protagonist, the 18-year-old protagonist of this book. I was writing this book in which she was a single mother raising a teenage daughter. And I was writing their two storylines, and then um, I was working with April Bernard, actually, at Bennington, uh -huh. and she said, I feel like you don't really know this mother character, which is not yeah. surprising. I was not a mother yet. I didn't. So she said, write some scenes from when she's younger, mm -hmm. when, when she was just coming up and wow. tattooing, when she was just finding her way. And those scenes had a lot more heat and energy for me wow. than all the other stuff. So I kind of just got rid of the whole rest of the book and started over wow. with Gina and what was she doing in 1986. That's so great. And I think for anybody who wants to write, that mm. is such a lesson in how stories tell us how they want to be told. Yeah, yeah that's you know? true. Yeah, that's, re that's really, that's so lovely. So, um, so this book is partly, I mean, it's very much a book about the art of tattooing, but it's also very much a book about the way that a woman can come into herself. Mm -hmm. That, um, that uh, I, th I think the, the most touching scenes in this story are these uh, scenes where Gina, you know, I wrote when I reviewed the book, I think that um, one of the things that's so incredible about Gina is she, she's growing up in a kind of a Riverhead-like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. town, and she has no sense of herself as a feminist, or even a pre-feminist, or a you know a second-wave feminist. She has no idea of the word feminism has no place in this book, but she's a person, and she wants to be a person and do what a person does. And it's so subversive. This book, yeah. it doesn't look it. But it's incredibly subversive, don't you? Don't you think? And was that your intention? It, you know, gosh, that's a deep question. <laughs> Sorry. No, I like it. Go right to I, I like a deep question. Um, I think so. What Susie is referring to is Gina's 18 years old, and she's basically growing up in her brother's tattoo shop. Um, and you know, there was not a tattoo shop on every corner back then. It was a much grittier environment. It was much more a fringe culture, rough around the edges, um, let alone like there really were not a lot of women in the field. And I think a lot of people who don't remember the 80s don't necessarily know that because now there's reality shows and there's women tattooing, you know, and they're, they're all over the place. But there weren't back then. Um, but all Gina knows is she's just graduated from she's got to get a job and this is what she wants to do she loves she loves drawing she's like I don't know I draw weird pictures that's the only skills I have what am I gonna do right. so um, she thinks to herself well there's no women at this tattoo shop and there's none that I know of but I know somewhere in far-off cities there's a couple why can I not do this I've been already doing my brother's grunt work all this time I've been cleaning this and building these needles and sterilizing this and whatever so um, I think for her, you're right that it's not, she's not like, I will embark on a feminist mission and I shall <laughs> make progress for all womankind. And like, you know, yeah. she's, she's like, I gotta get by, pay the bills mm. with the skills that I have in an environment where like nobody is helping me go right. to college or, right. so, um, but she encounters, of course, in that all the things that feminists work to change, you know, um, yeah. the assumption that she cannot do this job that her hand wouldn't be strong enough, that she couldn't work the long hours, that she couldn't um, defend herself against, you know, whatever, male customers, that, that she can't compete, or that she would steal somebody else's job or customers, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 
I mean, it, it it's actually it's it's odd because the um, a lot of the people who are trying to stop her, like her brother Dominic, yeah. who runs the tattoo shop, he loves her. He doesn't want her to be unsafe, and he's worried that it will be unsafe. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I mean, and so I think I think the uh, the grasp of what it of what it is to stand up for yourself is sort of seen from every angle in this novel and never in a way that you feel like, oh, June is punching me with her idea. <laughs> it's just a story, but it's a story about this person I'm so who glad. is doing this thing. So, um, so I have, uh, I, ha I have a question, I guess, about um, art and, um, and how, how Gina's, I think it's also fundamental to the book that Gina's feeling about her art is different from the men's feeling about mm -hmm. their art, the mm -hmm. men who are tattooing. And can you talk a little bit about that and maybe you know, sort of give us a little taste of it? Yeah, yes. So Gina, art for Gina starts out as just a coping mechanism. She has severe social anxiety. She's very awkward. She just sort of prefers to sit in the corner. Um, so she uses art to get through difficult moments when she wants to just disappear or she needs to handle anxiety or it's just, you know, I mean, did anybody hear doodle in class? Any classroom doodlers besides me? Yeah, she's a classroom doodler. Um, but you doodle enough, you get do something enough and you start to get better at it. Um, so she has this vision of, you know, back then there was sort of, so the designs, you may know this, the designs on the wall of a tattoo shop are called Flash. So there was sort of the classic old school Flash, anchors and mermaids and ships and flags and eagles. Mom. And, yeah, mom, yeah, mom heart, exactly. <laughs> and Gina thinks, well, you know, there's always like these pinup girls, but why can't we have Amelia Earhart? Why do we, you know, we have roses, but why couldn't we have hydrangeas? Mm. We, have, we have this, but why couldn't we have Saturn? And she's thinking, like, she draws this weird, ugly fish over and over again, which I brought, by the way, temporary tattoos, and I'll give you all an ugly fish. <laughs> so you, too, can have, have this weird tattoo. <laughs> um, but as the book progresses, she begins to think not just about, well, we could be weirder with this. We could be more, we could expand the creative boundaries, but sort of like, what do tattoos do for people emotionally? And in the section that I'm going to read, um, it gets into that a little bit. Yeah. Should I intro that section? Yeah. Should we should yes, do this? Yes, okay. Yeah, that so, would be great. Um, so I read from the book, and as I said, I did a lot of events last year. I've never read this scene at an event, and even though it's one of my favorites, um, because I tend to read something fun and light from the beginning and something that I know is going to make people laugh and doesn't require too much background. This is a, a ways into the book, um, but it's meaningful to me, and I wanted to read it when I thought about what would honor Women's History Month. Um, I thought I could do a chapter that is sort of like, oh, the adversity she faced. But I thought, what instead, I think I'd rather focus on the love that she has for this art form which is what keeps you going past mm -hmm. adversity and the sense of mission that she feels. Um, and that was very much drawn from the real life tattoo artist that I, that I interviewed, that I read about. Um, she, and the type of tattoo happens in this um, chapter that is, it's meaningful. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, the background that you need to know. So she, um, as you know, Susie said, is apprenticing in her brother's shop. Her brother ostensibly is supposed to be the one who's overseeing her training, but he's often distracted with various other things. Her mentor in the shop really is her friend Rick, who's another tattoo artist. His name is Rick Alvarez. He's a Chicano tattoo artist from East LA. He's here on Long Island because he has family here. His aunt has been sick. He's kind of helping with the family stuff. He is this warm, loving, brotherly presence to her. Um, and I, this character came to me. I do not even speak Spanish. So I was nervous about writing this character, but it was important to me to put him there. First of all, because he just kind of appeared and became important in the story, but also because um, Chicano tattooing had an extremely important influence on American tattooing as a whole. And I wanted to give that credit. There was a certain kind of fine line tattooing style that became very influential, and I just wanted to make sure that that was in there. So. Um, the, a wonderful thing happened. So I got, was very worried over years and years. I mean, I was doing my best and trying to do my research, but I was like, I need somebody 
who's within this culture to be able to read this and make sure that I'm getting this right. It was very important to me to, to do Rick justice. And in the most wonderful way, um, and I know this is a long intro, but you needed to know before. <laughs> because if I mangle the Spanish, that's why. And also I have to, I have to give this man credit every time I talk. So there's a writer, his name is Ruben Zegoyado. And I had written a review of his, of his novel, his first novel, because I loved it. Um, and it's called Throw. This is it. Um, and so then he and I struck up a correspondence. And he was just very generous and said, you know, what are you working on? And like, can I ever read pages for you? And I'm like, that's a crazy thing that you're offering. I would never have had the guts to ask somebody for a favor like that. And I said, yes, you, you really can. And this would be helpful. And this is why. He was just amazing. And I would send him my chapters with my character, Rick, and he would read them. And I was so, I was like, please tell me, am I being offensive? I'm being inauthentic. Like, I want to know everything. And luckily, like, I hadn't done anything terribly wrong, but he sent it back and it was, he would rewrite my character's dialogue. It was like these people I had loved all these years were walking into my living room and speaking to me and sounding more like themselves than they had ever sounded before. So this was extremely moving, and I just, I have to mention Ruben, like, every time I read, because it's important to me that he get credit for that. Also, it's important that you know why, if I mess, I'm really going to try to point out <laughs> these things, but okay. every expression, every whatever, that's, that's Ruben. Um, so, this, uh, about ten minutes it would take to read this, is that too sure, long? Sure. No, I don't think so. Okay. We can handle it. Okay. <laughs> and I, and I, I would like people to appreciate the, the writing, and, and it's so beautifully done so okay please yeah. take your time all right well thank you and if you hate it you you'll know it's only a little bit <laughs> it's not too it's a, a finite i'm you know sometimes writers get up and they're really like <laughs> anyway. 55 so. minutes later exactly. <laughs> one more poem yeah. um, <laughs> so um rick has a nickname for gina he calls her pesadita um which because she, she draws this fish all the time um, and he has told her that he has a very important client coming in for a tattoo and he wants her to assist and he says to her, you know, this is an incredible privilege, do not be late. So this is the chapter of, of that important appointment. Laughter echoed up the hallway from the front room. Rick's client was already there. The blinds were drawn and Rick was turning on floor lamps when Gina arrived at the threshold of the work area. He beckoned her. Tia. This is the apprentice I told you about. Gina, my aunt Andrea, my cousin Victor. Sitting in the swivel chair was a woman on her way to being grandmotherly. Soft lines in her forehead, relaxed blouse with buttons like rubies. A man of about Rick's age stood next to her at ease, wayfarer sunglasses propped on his head. They had the same playful mouth, skin a shade lighter than Rick's, rosy golden. Andrea looked at Gina. Are you helping? You're a baby. Gina sat down across the room, just watching. It's nice to meet you. Rick waved her closer. Tia, this is what I worked up for you. He grabbed his largest sketch pad. Andrea touched his wrist, stopping him. Remember, I don't want that prison style. They call it something else now, Tia, black and gray fine line. I'm a nice old lady, not some torcida. Rick started laughing. Yes, nice and proper for my tia, who's never been in the pinta. A church lady tattoo. <laughs> Shh, callese mijo. I'm not joining a gang. I don't want to look like an old school chola. I can't believe I'm doing this. Just make me beautiful. Mm. Rick looked up at Gina. She's fishing. My tia knows she already is. <laughs> Andrea gently slapped Rick's arm and punched air through her teeth. He opened the drawing pad. You want colors? Look. A watercolor peacock lit up the page. Its tail was draped behind it in a slackened fan, gold and green. Its breast glowed blue. He'd been working on this all week, starting each version with the same peculiar lopsided arc. Rick ran his finger along the arc. Here's the scar. The tail drapes across here. The body and neck, he traced a vertical line in the air midway between her armpit and her collarbone. And the head looks off this way. He touched her shoulder. How much can you cover? Andrea bit her lip. All of it, he said. Rick's aunt sat up to look down at her chest, trying as Gina was trying to picture how this peacock would sit. And then Gina noticed the hollow in her shirt. Make it feminine, Andrea said. My beautiful tear. 
Rick's voice was gentle, reverent. She could imagine him as a little boy bringing Andrea a fistful of dandelions and nuzzling his face in her dress. Dia, when I'm done, they're gonna call you an Aztec queen. Mijo, Andrea said, the Aztecs didn't have peacocks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll draw with a marker first, right on the skin, follow the shape of your body. If you like it, I'll make the stencil. Rick gestured toward her body as if it were a piece of museum art he was about to restore. Cuando estés lista? Take this off? Andrea tugged at her shirt collar. Rick went behind the counter for his markers. No needs, he had just unbuttoned. Victor settled down in the waiting area, facing away from Andrea. Do you want Gina to turn around too? After all those medical students walking in and out, Andrea's laugh was nervous, but Gina had already turned away. She set up Rick's machine and condiment cups for the pink, laid out the spray bottle and petroleum jelly and the razor. She was afraid for Andrea. How fresh was this far? When she looked up, Andrea was sitting with her shirt half off, and Rick, wearing latex gloves, was drawing on her shoulder with a pink marker. Where her breast would have been was a pale brown scar curving out from her armpit. It was like a seam, the flesh puffed out above and below. Gina looked away again. Do you want music? We brought some. Victor handed her a cassette, Javela Vargas, scribbled on a label. She put it in a tape deck and a woman's throaty voice began to sing over acoustic guitar. Andrea sank back with a great exhale. Every step of Rick's process today seemed even more meticulous than usual. Finally, he took his machine in hand. Machine, it's called a machine, not a gun. Or a gun. Okay. Um, Do it like your IVs, Victor said to Andrea over his shoulder. Take a deep breath, tranquila. Thank you, boss, Andrea said. But she did. And Rick dipped his needle in black and began to draw the long pod of the body. Her eyes watered and she bit her lip, but she didn't cry. No one spoke. Over the buzz of the machine, Chavela Vargas sang, Volve, Volve, in a voice like a crimson banner weathering the wind. An hour later, as Rick layered tail feathers over the scar, Andrea finally spoke. When I was little, she said, I dreamed I'd be a world famous dancer and travel the world and I'd have a costume with peacock feathers. Rick smiled. You never told me that. Gina looked. You just chose a peacock out of nowhere? She couldn't take her eyes off Rick's work. Each careful teardrop in the tail, each flourish and fringe. We have a connection, Rick said. This one and me, we are like uña y mugre. It means dirt and fingernail connected forever. <laughs> but I didn't know you wanted to be a dancer. Your mother was the angel girl Santita and I was the wild one, the girl without shame. Andrea started laughing. If she could see me now, her sister getting a tattoo. The outline of the peacock bloomed across her chest. Rick had planned well. The seam fell naturally in a hollow along the tail, and the flesh above swelled the crest of the feathers. Rick, Gina breathed. It's amazing. You're doing so good. Rick lifted his foot from the pedal. Mother Teresa does good. I do well. Say <laughs> abuena with Gina. Don't be mean to her, Andrea said. Eyes still closed. You're also doing good. She began to hum along with the music. Pon me la mano aquí, Macarena. Pon me la mano aquí. After a while, she opened her eyes. Gina, you know Chavela? No. She caused a scandal in ranchera music because she sang love songs to women. Gina waited to see if there was more but Andrea just closed her eyes again, relaxing more deeply into the chair. She didn't look grandmotherly anymore. Her belly rolls were bolts of fawn silk. A flush appeared in her face like an aurora. When Rick was nearly finished, Andrea became quiet again. She turned her cheek to the chair and began to breathe more deliberately as if counting the length of each breath. Tia, you want a break? Andrea murmured something, eyes closed. Rick stopped the machine. Gina, could you walk up to the store for me? What do you want? Oh, he wiped blood from his own skin. Cold juice, no hurry. Understood. They were kicking her out for a while. She left her car behind, walked a mile in the cold to Rick's favorite deli and brought back a half gallon of Hawaiian punch. When she came through the door again, she stood in the dark hallway for a minute, letting her eyes adjust. The machine had stopped, the tape was over. And then she heard voices, a click, a whir. She carried the juice to the front, where Rick was photographing his aunt's tattoo. 
Andrea was lounging like the queen of Sheba. Her eyes were as pink and swollen as the skin around the tattoo. After she had been bandaged up, Andrea patted her nephew on the arm. Miho, give me a minute with Gina. Rick and Victor went out back, saying they'd walk by the docks, stretch their legs. Andrea looked through her purse. My Ricky said you ask a hundred questions a day. He thought you might have some for me. We were talking the other day about whether tattooing does any good, Gina said, and I wondered. She paused, too shy to finish. Ricky said your tattoo was beautiful, Andrea said. Can I take a look? Gina unzipped her hoodie and slipped down her tank top straps to expose the fakes. Breathtaking, Andrea said. So you tell me, did it do you any good? I don't know if I've grown into it yet, Gina said. She sat down, letting the hoodie fall to the bench. I don't think I could be half as brave as you, sitting there like that in front of my nephew. That was very personal. Why did you go to Rick for that tattoo? Wasn't that awkward? Who else was I going to go to? Can you see me walking into some tattoo parlor, parlor full, of, full of big, tough boys? Mm. Hey, the old lady's here. <laughs> she blotted her lipstick on a tissue from her purse. You're not old, Gina said. Andrea waved her hand. My little corazon. I'm old enough to not belong in a tattoo parlor. Mm. I nursed babies with that breast. You cry and cry over it. What you lost and can't get back but I was tired of crying. And I'd seen what my Ricky could do, and I asked him to make something beautiful. She started to tear up again. Gina handed her a tissue, and Andrea blotted the corner of her eyes. See now, Gina, if you were a full-fledged artist here, I would have said to Ricky, let that girl do it. Mm. Wouldn't you, if you were me? At a moment like that, Corazon, you could make a lot of women feel whole again. Mm. Mm. And I'll stop there. Oh. Um.